I'm uh, Paul Kruger. I'm one of the founders of the Vancouver Mycological Society. And um, one thing that got me interested in mushrooms was I moved here from a part of the country, the Okanagan, Penticton, that is pretty dry and we don't have a lot of mushrooms there. And I moved to Vancouver when I was 16 and heard about magic mushrooms and started looking into it. And I got very captivated just by the idea of hunting for mushrooms in general. I took a book out of the library to find out if I could find these magic mushrooms. I forgot about the magic mushrooms for a while and just ran around looking at mushrooms. Thought they were so neat. It was such a tremendous year that year. 1970 was a tremendous mushroom year. And um, so this talk is about the magic mushrooms. A lot of people know about the magic mushrooms refer to two different things. There's this psilocybin containing psilocybe mushrooms, which is the subject of this talk. And then another mushroom that's called a magic mushroom is the Amanita muscaria, the red uh, toadstool with white warts on the cap. And that's a different topic altogether. So this concentrates on the magic mushrooms, the psilocybin containing magic mushrooms. And lots of people know of them and they've heard lots of stories and they might have dabbled with them, but they may not know the whole sweep and scope of their history and importance and that sort of thing. So I begin by explaining that um, the magic mushrooms were of great importance through history for thousands of years in Central America. And by Central America, I mean Mexico and the Isthmus countries of um, Central America, uh, the Isthmus that connects North and South America. And that was the realm of the Aztecs and the Maya and other uh, native groups of, the, of that area who all have a common cultural heritage. They spring from the same ancient cultures that go way, way back thousands and thousands of years. And there are several hundred stone carvings referred to as mushroom stones. There's some 800 of these known at present. And uh, they date right back to the early pre classic period of the Maya culture uh, about this particular stone was in my care for many years. It was purchased in the highlands of Guatemala by a Vancouver resident who traveled uh, there in the mid 70s and he bought this stone um, and it's believed to date back to about 800 BC. That was the pre-classic Mayan period see if my little changer works here. We have other evidence. Oh, by the way, of the 800 known mushroom stones, not a single one is in the collection of a Central American museum. They're all in foreign collections or foreign museums. Um, I tried to get the owner of that one to donate it to Guatemala, but he wasn't into that, which I think is regrettable. Uh, there's um, very little written record uh, remaining from the Aztec culture. The Aztec were the culture that was dominant in Central America when the um, Spanish um, conquest occurred. Uh, Aztec were pretty well wiped out by foreign diseases introduced by the Spaniards. The Spaniards thought it was their superior technology and religion, but it was actually their superior germs that wiped out the culture. And they also practiced the um, Inquisition with full vigor. The Inquisition was dying out in Europe. The witch hunts were very unpopular. And they managed to bring the, the practices over to the New World. And uh, they pretty well burned every single written record of the Aztec people that wasn't etched in stone. There were only two codices, two written manuscripts that survived the conquest. And in one of them, we can see the creation myth of these peoples. The, all the cultures of Central America share the same creation myth and involves a series of deities, gods, goddesses, and um, who go on quests and the whole thing is very similar through all these cultures. Here we see mushrooms in pairs being held by the different deities and they play a role in the creation myth of all these cultures. And here is a manuscript that was painted by a converted Aztec scribe. He was asked by Sahugan, a, um, one of the 
um, Spanish uh, monks who studied the destroyed Aztec culture to portray different par aspects of Aztec life. And so he showed the use of the mushrooms. The Aztec is sitting, eating the mushrooms in front of the mushrooms here. And the devil is appearing to him as a result of eating the mushrooms. Uh, there's a bit of a sneaky thing that he did here, which is the um, Aztec had quite a well-developed pictographic language, and they had extensive documents and scrolls. And in all of these writings, if they wanted to portray something as sacred, they'd color it green because jade was sacred in that culture. So he snuck in the green mushrooms indicating that they were sacred. Now, this has so thoroughly suppressed the use of these mushrooms by the Spanish conquistadors and the, Rome, the um, Inquisition of the um, Spanish domination that this use was driven far underground. Aztec culture, by the way, was totally obsessed with hallucinogens. A lot of their religion was based on undergoing hallucinogenic experiences. They had enormous numbers of plants and other substances, mushrooms and things that they used to create trance states. And if you are under the impression that use of hallucinogens leads to idyllic, blissful, hippy-dippy-like peacenik behavior, remember that the Aztecs committed human sacrifice on a scale that's never been equaled. And with the last uh, emperor of the Aztecs, Mont Moctezuma's um, uh, coronation feast involved, it's believed, upwards of 60,000 sacrificial victims to be sacrificed. Well, hundreds of thousands of people ate mushrooms and listened to music and watched the sacrifices. So some people have said that the Aztecs deserved the Spaniards and vice versa. Right. They're, not, they're not friendly cultures. But anyway, to our modern view. Uh, R. Gordon Wasson was the vice president of J.P. Morgan, one of several vice presidents in New York City. He um, married a Russian woman by the name of Valentina. And they, during their honeymoon, they noticed that they had very different attitudes towards mushrooms. She found some mushrooms and was just delighted and started picking them to eat. And he was horrified coming from British Boston stock. And he was brought up to believe that all, all these things were filthy toadstools, except for the little white button mushroom that you buy in a supermarket. That's a mushroom. Everything else is a toadstool. So, and after... Uh, the next day, when he, he was sure that he'd be a, a widower, and the next morning they sat down and they talked about it after she'd eaten her big meal of mushrooms and he refused to touch any. And they were trying to figure out why they had such different attitudes towards mushrooms. And that launched them on a lifelong study of what we now call ethnomycology, the study of human attitudes and uses of mushrooms, attitude towards the uses of mushrooms. And... Um, so uh, he had heard rumors of magic mushroom, of, of sacred mushrooms, religious use of mushrooms in a ceremonial context in parts of Mexico and Central America. He'd been sent photograph of a mushroom stone in a German collection. He'd received messages from a few people in Europe who mentioned that they'd heard of this. They'd, some people had encountered little passages in old Spanish writing about the conquest that mentioned mushrooms. And so he slowly got this picture together that there is still a ceremonial use of mushrooms happening in Central America. And he got things together and launched an expedition to go find the use of the mushrooms. And um, he succeeded in tracking down uh, a location where there were people that were still using the mushrooms in ceremonial, shamanic, ritual, healing ceremonies. And in, the, in Hawaka State, in the um, village of, of Huatla de Jimenez, which is the, now the capital, I believe, of Hawaka State, some kind of administrative capital. So in 1955, they got permission from a, a curandera, or female traditional healer, to sit in on one of her ceremonies, and she allowed them to photograph uh, and film the ceremony and to do a complete sound recording. And um, that is now left. The entire ceremony was preserved, was recorded. And that was a um, great, tremendous uh, documentation. 
And Wasson wrote an article that was published in Life magazine, Seeking the Magic Mushrooms of Mexico, explaining this great adventure he had discovering the ceremonial use of mushrooms in Mexico. And that's how the world first found out about the magic mushrooms. So they attended this healing ceremony that was held for the very serious purpose of divining the cause of a serious illness in a young man and um, in finding out what could be done to cure that and uh, to see if he could be saved. And um, they conducted the ceremony at night in secret. They gathered mushrooms. Here, Maria Sabina, the Kikurandera, is passing the mushrooms through the smoke of copal incense, which is a tree resin that smells very much, much like frankincense and myrrh. And anybody that's attended a Catholic mass in a Latin American country would have smelt the copal incense, which is substitutes for, inc uh, for frankincense and myrrh in Central America. So here the mushrooms are being handed to the participants and they're eaten very solemnly, washed down with a bit of chocolate. Maria Sabina chants in the Mazatec language, which is a dialect of Nahuatl, which is the Aztec language. And the whole ceremony of some eight, nine hours is all recorded. And um, then once the mushrooms begin to take effect, the lights or all the candles are blown out and the ceremony proceeds in darkness except for the flash of the photographer and the lights from the uh, movie cameras. And um, Maria Sabina asked some mushroom. They believed that the spirits speak through the mushroom to the curandera, and the curandera communicates to the spirits through the mushrooms. The mushrooms are personified as having little spirits within them. And the um, communication goes back and forth. So she's communicating with the mushrooms. What is the cause of the young man's illness and is unable to receive a real answer? Can anything be done? No, there's nothing that can be done. The, man's, the young man's fate is written. The, the powers that be have written his fate that he shall die and there's nothing that can be done. And sure enough, the man, young man did die a week or two after the ceremony was held. Um, I hear Maria Sabina is pleading with the spirits to spare the young man and they are inflexible on it. So this was very powerful as you can probably imagine um, and Wasson was very blown away by it and he, at the time he en had enlisted the aid of Roger M who was the director of the Paris Museum of Natural History a very renowned mycologist of his time and they did exploration in the areas where the mushrooms had been found to be used. They collected many different types of mushrooms, most of them new to science. And one of the most commonly used and highly regarded of these mushrooms was the um, Psilocybe Mexicana, which they discovered and named. And it's a little pointy, little slender thing that grows in pastures and meadows. And um, they were able to collect a whole bunch of them and they were able to uh, dry out a whole bunch and bring some fresh back to Paris and they were able to work out ways to culture them, to cultivate them. And they are able to generate enough material to send off to chemists for exploration. One of the chemists they sent material to was Albert Hofmann at Sandoz in Switzerland, Basel, Switzerland, and he is a now famous um, Sci uh, chemist who discovered LSD, inadvertently did the first LSD experience and had the lab, the only lab in the world probably equipped and, and with people with enough knowledge to figure out what the active ingredients were. And he was able to identify the active ingredient as what's called a tryptamine. It's a type of indole compound that has what's called an indole ring with a little doodad sticking off it, related to our own brain chemistry, very closely related to serotonin, which is one of the neurochemicals that make our brain work. And um, serotonin is responsible for a lot of sleep-related dreaming and there's various things like that that um, are linked to serotonin. And um, 
he was able to elucidate the structure. It's very unusual. The only, at the time, uh, naturally occurring or uh, indolic compound that had a phosphorus involved. And I like to joke, by the way, that this is what the molecule looks like before taking the mushrooms, and this is after. <laughs> right. Much more colorful. And um, so uh, they were able to synthesize this compound. They named it psilocybin after psilocybe, the genus of mushrooms that are the predominant magic mushrooms. <laughs> they were able to synthesize these little pink pills and they took some to back to Mexico, to Huaca, to Huatla, and convinced Maria Sabina to conduct a ceremony substituting the pink pills for the pairs of mushrooms. And she handed out pairs of the little pink pills and went through the whole ceremony. It was out of season for the mushrooms at that time of year. Uh, the ma magic mushrooms in Mexico is seasonal just like they are here. And uh, she was, at first, was very excited. She said that now she could do her healing all year round. And then she looked rather sad, according to Wasson's telling of it, and said, but they have lost their power. They have lost their magic, because humans have conquered them. So the, the sacredness was taken out of them, though she considered them still to be medicine. And out of all this work, they produced a magnificent pair of volumes which thoroughly explore different aspects of the mushroom, mushrooms and their ceremonies involving the mushrooms, the chemistry. They had musicologists studying the chanting, a linguist studying the language that was used. Um, all, it's all sorts of aspects of these mushrooms were studied. So it stands as one of the greatest studies of newly discovered things used by humans, uh, the, the study of ethnobiology is a study of the relationship of humans to other living things and this is considered one of the greatest uh, single works exploring the different aspects of things used by humans, living things used by humans. And um, one of the people that was captivated by the accounts was Timothy Leary, so he traveled down to Mexico stayed in a, rented a via in uh, Cuerno de Vaca and bought some mushrooms in the marketplace and ate them and washed them down with white rum and then had his first trip. It was Timothy Leary's first turn on. He was very enthusiastic. He went back to Harvard and initiated research studies looking at the use of these mushrooms as a way to unlock hidden psychological issues in uh, hardcore prison in, um, inmates, um, chronic alcoholics, people with various psychological issues. And initially he had some very impressive success and then Timothy was eating a lot himself and learned about LSD and began to explore LSD and distribute it and became a very vocal advocate of the use of hallucinogens and pretty much launched what we call the psychedelic era of the infamous 1960s and into the 70s. Now some of the tourists who went down there um, experienced the mushrooms. They went off uh, on the slopes of Mount Popocatl seeking the the Psilocybe Mexicana in the pastures and meadows and uh, tripped out on them, came back to their homes in North America or Western Europe and pretty soon discovered mushrooms that looked just like the ones they'd seen in Mexico that, and tried them and found that they indeed had the same activity as the Mexican mushrooms. This happened in various points, but the first documented recorded time when um, that we can prove that people were taking mushrooms for recreational purposes that were growing outside of the traditional use area comes from Vancouver. We're very, I'm very proud of that. I think we were, we were very key in the whole movement here because in 1965 the RCMP confiscated mushrooms 
from a group of UBC students who were partying with them. There's a little clique of students, and some of them had gone down to Mexico, done the gringo, hongo tourism thing, and then they came back and somehow discovered the little Liberty Cap, Psilocybe semilanciata, that looked just like the Psilocybe mexicana. Tried them, and sure enough, they worked. So a little group of friends, you know, tell their friends, and pretty soon there's this little subculture partying with the mushrooms. Somehow it came to the RCMP's attention in 1965, and that's the first written record of this use outside. And after that, it didn't take long for information to diffuse widely, and pretty soon areas of BC became famous as great mushroom picking fields. And these areas include oh, all around the airport in Richmond. There used to be security people chasing kids out from between the runways at the airport, and they used to, on the way out to Tawasson, see kids picking under the power lines on the way to the causeway in Tawasson. And um, the Queen Charlotte Islands had lots of really productive fields. Um, up the Fraser Valley, up in Mission, and um, areas up there. Uh, Central Vancouver Island, Cowichan Valley area was quite famous around Duncan or Drunken, Vancouver Island, <laughs> and um, other areas. I found out about a little, almost lost little scene like that. Apparently there was another area near Revelstoke where people discovered these things growing, a little town in the valley there on the Eagle River. And so um, there is a little culture there, and that almost died out until some kids that lived there had got really curious and they'd heard some old time hippies talking about how they used to pick mushrooms in the area. So they got into the books and found out where the Liberty Caps grow and searched all the meadows and refound one of the old fields that people used to go to and was still producing. So now it's, it's revived as a, as a popular field. And um, it caused lots of problems because in the uh, late 60s, there was a sudden deterioration of the whole hippie scene with the Altamont motorcycle gangs, arrival of hard drugs, methamphetamine and heroin. And a lot of the old time hippies got freaked out by this new hardcore drug scene and eventually um, shunned the hardcore drug users. And it's a big move back to natural drugs and the mushrooms became very popular, but people were not too discriminating and they equated it often to smoking pot, where it was a recreational thing that just about anything anybody could do and people would be handing out mushrooms at parties and there are some people that should not eat magic mushrooms, people with very unstable personalities that are walking a narrow edge with insanity, psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar, people that are, have a lot of crap going on in their life that makes things difficult, recent bereavement, things like that can be very tough. And so this willy-nilly use led to lots of problems, psychological meltdowns, hospitalizations. There became a big scare about the evil hallucinogens that um, in 1974, uh, the mushrooms were added to the food and drug list of prohibited compounds. The psilocybin and psilocin were listed and um, they became illegal. In the fall, rains would come, certain pastures <laughs> would, uh, suddenly people would appear in the pastures in the fields and uh, they do, this is called the psilocybe stoop here. <laughs> And I uh, see this all over BC and wherever these productive pastures and fields were. And um, this is what they were after. These are Psilocybe semilanciata, the Liberty Cap. And now this fellow is one of three brothers uh, from Salt Spring Island. And there was a period, uh, they were illegalized in, I think, 74. In 78 or 79, a woman in mass at Queen Charlotte Islands was arrested. Uh, several containers of mushrooms, dried mushrooms, were confiscated from her. She was charged with possession of psilocybin. Her defense lawyer said that um, 
Possession of a mushroom does not constitute possession of a restricted substance. It just happens to be in that mushroom. A dried mushroom is just a mushroom after all. And it's not the same as possessing pure psilocybin. Because, uh, um, you know, it's just, it's just a mushroom after all. And she was, her charges were dismissed. The Crown appealed the dismissal. A Supreme Court upheld the dismissal. And so for a period from about 79 to about 82, the mushrooms were considered legal. And then it was overturned in a further uh, Supreme Court ruling in 1982. And ever since then, it's been considered illegal to possess the magic mushrooms. Um, but um, during the period when they were technically legal, this fellow and his two brothers founded a church and some other people called the Fane of the Psilocybe Mushroom Association. They chartered it as a religious organization. And... Um, and in, in the charter of the church, it said that the official sacrament was the magic mushroom, psilocybe mushroom, and therefore anybody that belongs to the church under religious freedom can possess the mushrooms. And they did this when they were legal, so figuring that if they were made illegal again, people that belonged to the church would be immune from prosecution. Now, they made me some kind of honorary, I think it was <laughs> Archpope or something, or <laughs> Vice Pope. They gave me an honorary position, but no funny hat. I didn't get a funny hat and a gown, even though I wanted one. But um, <laughs> next time. And so now, one of the brothers, Ethan, uh, did a, it was, a, the, the, all three were very extremely talented artists and such. So Ethan was a painter, and he tried to capture the visual effects of eating the psilocybin mushrooms with his painting. Now, I want to make very clear that the interesting effects of the mushrooms are not the visual effects primarily. They're very interesting for us, but in the traditional context of healing, and religious application of them. It is the emotional uh, effects and the deep spiritual psychological effects that are sought after, not the pretty visions. And to a traditional Central American healer or curandero or curandera, uh, they, they actually consider the sort of Western European, North American, modern cultural obsession with these colored visions that, people get when they take hallucinogens as being vegetable television, sort of just a sort of a superficial thing that's entertainment, but they're looking for deep shaking, you know, emotional, uh, deep mind sort of workout, not, not pretty pictures. So these paintings can only capture the visual aspect not the deep emotional thing, which is also the deep emotional thing is where people that have a delicate balance get maybe in trouble if they experiment with the mushrooms. So one of the first things is, a, oh, by the way, the first effect when somebody has eaten the mushrooms is yawning. Nobody knows why, but I've often been in a room where people are eating mushrooms and somebody will yawn. I say, oh, you're getting off on the mushrooms. They say, no, I don't feel anything. I say, oh, sure you do. Sure you do. And then just a few minutes later, there will be a <laughs> shift in consciousness, and then the effects become apparent. But uh, the first initial thing is yawning. Uncontrollable, and often the people are not aware that they're yawning. And if you get up doing a public talk, by the way, and start talking about yawning, people start yawning all over the room. <laughs> It's a funny thing about yawning, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so, um, and then there's sparkly colors. The colors become very sparkly and intensified. And anybody who has had this sort of experience suddenly realizes what the whole movement of modern art originated in when the first impressionist school experimented with pontalism, where they used spots of pure color mixed together to create a a palette in a painting that, that looks so lifelike and sparkly, but you look from a distance at it and you can recognize a fairly ordinary landscape. These vivid points of color give it a vibrancy that's quite impressive. Well, all those dudes that founded the schools of modern art experimented with things like, um, no, not psilocybin mushrooms because they weren't known in the late 1800s, but things like absinthe and hashish and opium and other mind alterants. If only they'd had the mushrooms, they would have been.
launching into cubism right off the dot probably. But anyway, and so also enhancement of shadow and contrast tends to be quite noticeable. And then eventually swirly patterns begin to emerge. People will often see in a random uh, surface like a stucco wall of a building. They'll suddenly see swirly bits and sometimes what look like letters and symbols emerging out of it. What's actually a random pattern. And, um, and if things like shrubberies can get very interesting indeed. Now Ethan made a pilgrimage. This is the villa where uh, Timothy Leary went in Kerno de Vaca and did his first mushroom trip. So Leary rented out the villa and, um, and Ethan went there one year and he ate mushrooms in front of it. He couldn't get permission to hang out inside it, but he ate mushrooms outside and then he painted after. Oh, I should mention these paintings are all done after the effects have worn off. Uh, Hand-eye coordination isn't too sharp and do the actual influence of the mushrooms, but the mushroom experience stays with a person so they can uh, represent it from memory and from recall quite easily. And then um, eventually these swirly pa oh there's also great depth, uh, changes in perception and very interesting things that can happen looking at movement. And this is uh, Ethan laying on his back in a snowstorm on Salt Spring Island looking up through the trees and he Spent hours apparently one night doing that and the next day tried to paint what he'd experienced with this looking up at the snow. I mean, looking up at snow falling from the sky is trippy enough if you're just, you know, straight, but under the influence of mushrooms evidently it froze him on the ground for a while. And then um, eventually you can have swirly patterns and images that begin to come from within. So with the eyes open or closed, you're having these images coming at you. And those are what we could call true hallucinations. Everything up to that point has been modification of the visual input that you're getting from outside. But eventually you can have all this uh, visual stuff coming from within. and. Um, and then at one time there's a big fad among the, the uh, trippers to seek out the white light and it was supposed to be some apocalyptic summation of all the experience. You're supposed to have the white light experience and break through barriers and it was supposed to be the cat's pajamas when it came to the psychedelic experience. And I found many people would go on about the white light and they always seemed like they didn't fare so well, it, I suspected that maybe this white light thing that they've been chasing wasn't the ultimate goal of the mushrooms, because the people that went on so much about white light didn't seem to do well with it. Anyway, and um, so here is a short list of the types of psilocybin containing magic mushrooms that occur in British Columbia, and you'll see that while most of them are the genus Psilocybe, that's how psilocybe is spelt. Um, there are other mushrooms unrelated to psilocybe that also contain the same principles, psilocybin and psilocin. And I'll go through these. They happen to be primarily growing in alphabetical order in this presentation. <laughs> but um, I'll just quickly go through with a little blurb about each. Now, this is an extremely powerful very large uh, native, uh, not quite native, but uh, North American psilocybin containing mushroom, psilocybe azurescens. It uh, was originally found in Astoria, Oregon, and it um, has since been spread all over the place. It's easily grown in wood chips. So now it's being cultivated in different areas, in just people's yards and public areas, wherever you can lay down wood chips that you inoculate with it. Extremely powerful, uh, two or three of these would be a trip for a full-grown person. Psilocybe beocystis used to be a real weed mushroom. Now many of these magic mushrooms that I discuss are only known from disturbed areas, areas that are urban, uh, highly modified by humans, horticultural, agricultural, uh, some of them are associated with grazed livestock, browsed areas like pastures and meadows, and places where introduced grasses have been in, have been brought in as fodder. 
And this is one of an example of that. And this used to be a very dominant weed around Vancouver. Van Dusen Gardens used to be chock full of it. Every year, the gardeners would give us boxfuls of them to put out on display. Uh, public spaces, the university campuses were chock-a-block full. Institutional landscaping like hospitals, police stations, courthouses. Um, there is um, uh, people's gardens. It was in soil mixes and sometimes turf was brought in for new developments and the whole turf lawn area of a new development would blossom with these. It was very prevalent and then some years ago somebody asked me at one of our annual shows here, have the gardeners brought in the Beocystes this year? And I said, oh, you know, I don't think they've brought any in for years and years. So I began looking in our records. These appear to have disappeared entirely from British Columbia for the last perhaps 15 years. Not a single specimen has been found in that time. Once they were one of the most common weed mushrooms in landscaped areas. And they're very characteristic, little crimpled cap edge, like a bottle cap edge. And very dark brown, they're kind of smelly. They grow sometimes in great numbers. They can get quite large, very potent. Blue staining is a characteristic of the magic mushrooms, along with some other characters. Not only magic mushrooms stain blue, some poisonous bullwheat stain blue too. Some other groups of mushrooms have blue staining. But in these psilocybin-containing mushrooms, blue staining is a character that's looked for. Generally speaking, the darker blue staining a mushroom is, the more powerful it is, the more psilocybin psilocin it has contained in it, but if the actual mushrooms themselves have stained really dark blue, have turned really dark blue, it means that that content in that particular mushroom is oxidized and that produces a blue pigment, the breakdown of the active components. So it means that the active constituents have actually broken down in that particular specimen. People used to age and abuse their mushrooms, trying to get them as dark blue or blackish as possible, thinking that that indicated that they'd be that much more powerful. And they'd end up very disappointed because they wouldn't catch a buzz because all the active stuff was broken down or downright sick because with food poisoning, because they'd uh, age them enough so bacteria are in there and they're unwholesome to eat. So uh, like any other mushroom, you want them to be nice and fresh and pristine as possible. Uh, they're also dried out and eaten dried quite often. Psilocybe cyanescens is another very powerful magic mushroom, grows in wood chips and landscaped areas. Uh, quite a large mushroom, characteristic wavy cap. I believe it's actually the same as the first one I showed, Psilocybe azurescens. The only difference is the shape of the cap. Now it'd be very easy for a slight mutation to cause irregular growth of the cap. And hence you'd have what would otherwise be a conical cap come out wavy because you have differential zones of growth. And so I think probably it's just a sport, as they'd say in the plant world, or a mutation that just happened to become weedy and therefore became very common. And um, and these grow very easily in wood chips, so people can grow them in their yards. And here's uh, an avid organic gardener who grows lots of interesting things, and he uses wood chips to line pathways to get around the garden. He's got raised beds with veggies and flowers and fruits. And then when the season comes, he has all these clumps of cyanescence growing in his own backyard very discreetly, and that's um, pretty pretty easy way to have a supply of these things available should one choose to have them around. Um, now, I've been talking about how they like disturbed areas and seem to be associated with human disturbance. This is a site in British Columbia where there was a mushroom, hallucinogenic mushroom growing in a truly wild habitat which is now unfortunately gone. A natural disaster wiped out this habitat. But this was at the base of a volcano, Mount Meager, on the Lillooet River, the headwaters of the Lillooet River. And this is a flood zone in the river where every spring melt off, this whole area is inundated with raging water. 
And um, then as the summer proceeds and into early fall, the waters drop down and the glacial melt slows down. And then these little side channels and ponds um, sort of dry out and become rather stable. And then there's little tiny mushrooms that grow connected to the roots of the willows and alders that manage to cling to the volcanic ash in this area. And these are these, Silospe cyanofibrillosa. And it was a really funny habitat. I just happened to stumble on them. And then as I sort of zoned in on the habitat, these little shrubs and trees and this wild, you know, uh, uh, greatly ripped apart landscape. Once a year, you know, for much of each year, this area's got raging water and all sorts of things happening, avalanches going down into it. And then for that brief period where it's fairly stable, I learned that I could find these. I went up and down the river and found that wherever these suitable habitats were, there were a few of these. And so I got thinking, well, if this area was to be logged, it, we got it made into a provincial park, Upper Lillooet Provincial Park, and other areas protected. But if it had been logged, and logging operations had maybe happened to choose one of these riverside areas as a log sort yard, and then the logs were put on trucks and taken to a mill, and the bark torn off them. And that bark goes to a uh, landscape company that uses it to chip up and add to a soil mix that they prepare in a big compost system. You could have these things suddenly enter into the human landscaping horticultural realm. And that, I think, is why things like Psilocybe baocystes suddenly exploded as weeds and then disappeared because it's in nature very rare, but it just happened that human, humans happened to accidentally introduce the living material into the human sort of uh, horticultural soil preparation, you know, soil mixes, and then it could have spread all up and down the coast with plant material, you know, plants planted in that mix who shipped back and forth and eventually became very widespread weeds and then disappeared after a while. So that's, uh, and then now I'll just go through a few obscure things here. So let's be Femitaria is a well-known European species, a little ring on the stem. It looks like a liberty cap, little pointy cap. Grows in the same habitat, pastures and meadows, usually grazed ones, or at least with introduced fodder grasses. And um, here again, I think that because these habitats where this grows in North America only exist since European influence and the Europeans brought their livestock and fodder grasses in. I think this is a case of introduction of a European species into North America. And um, there's what it looks like, uh, with the little ring on the stem. Psilocybe pelliculosa grows in woodland settings, but disturbed ones, so it's often on logging roads and like uh, bark mulched or wood chip trails in parks and natural semi-natural areas. And um, I find it quite often actually on little footbridges in parks. And uh, it's a very nondescript little slender little brown mushroom that grows in the forest and therefore it's rather unfortunate. Um, it's not at all powerful, has very little psilocybin and psilocin content. It takes a lot of these to catch a buzz, as we say. And they very much resemble just any number of other little tiny slender little brown mushrooms in the forest. So it's, it's a type that might be out there in lots of areas, but it's not recommended uh, that you gather and try consuming them. They also grow with potentially poisonous gallerina mushrooms. They look almost identical. And one time we, we were doing a um, foray in an area a woodland area and I went along a trail and I found just gobs of these and gobs of a gallerina species called heterocystis and they're growing in together and they're like patch of this one, patch of that one, patch of this one, patch of that one. So I said, oh, I'm tired of trying to sort them out. I was pick them all together and put them in one container and then sort them out. So then later I sat down where we were had our meetings and I started sorting them out, and I had a pile of ones I was sure was Pelliculosa, 
ones I was sure was Gallerina heterocystis, and then a pile about equal size to the other two of ones that I just couldn't tell one were one or the other. And so that's about 50-50 chance, I figure, that you'll make a mistake. Or is that 25-75? I'm not sure. Anyway, um, very difficult to distinguish sometimes. And they can be quite late in the season. This is a classic Liberty Cap, the uh, Psilospe semilanceata. That's the one that people first started consuming. It grows all around the temperate world wherever European agriculture and livestock and fodder grasses are. And it was named Liberty Cap by the British uh, because it resembles the French Liberty, the uh, female symbol of the revolution who had a little cap that sort of nods off to the side like a Smurf hat. And that's called a um, Phrygian cap. It was chosen by the revolutionaries to represent freedom because in ancient Greece, the Phrygian people were enslaved. And when they were given their freedom, they were all issued these little distinctive caps to mark them as freemen. Now, after that, in the classic world, these little hats became the symbol of freedom. And then the, that was revived by the French Revolution. And then the British saw a resemblance with this little eccentric little point on the cap to uh, the Phrygian cap. So they named the little mushroom Liberty Cap in the 1880s or 1890s, long before the psychedelic properties were known. Seems like an appropriate name in some ways. And there you got a great little Phrygian cap. See, it looks like a little Smurf hat. And, um, and this is Haida Gwaii. This is a bird sanctuary in Haida Gwaii that used to be one of the biggest harvest areas in the late 70s. And apparently it still produces lots and lots of mushrooms. This picture is just a couple years old. And the RCMP there apparently love mushroom season because they have these ATV things in their, in their uh, detachment. And they never get to use them except when the mushroom pickers are in the, the fields there. So they'll get a call from a citizen saying they've spotted kids in the field and the cops get all smiley and run, jump on their ATVs and chase the kids around and just have a ball. That's you know what they look to all year, look forward to all year long. Uh, and this is uh, exam this is what they look like. Very slender, sort of wavy stem and a little pointy cap and the gelatinous layer that you can peel off the cap. And when they dry out in the sun or just dry out, they turn white and you can no longer see the little streaks. These are because they're translucent caps when they're moist. You can see the gills through the cap tissue. And then when they dry out, they go opaque and white. This is called uh, hygrophonating. It's another character with the blue staining, the peelable gelatinous layer they're used to distinguish these, and purple-brown colored spores as opposed to other possible colors. And this is a Psilospe semilanceata dried, and generally speaking, for a light recreational dose, a one dried gram has become standard. And so in the black market, it's often one gram increments that are sold for a single use. And one of our mushroom shows here in Van Dusen many years ago, I gave my magic mushroom presentation. There were presentations and displays about poisonous mushrooms. When we were cleaning up at the end of the show, we found this little tiny Ziploc baggie on the floor under the magic mushroom display. So we assumed that somebody had come here after buying a little baggie of mushrooms, probably $10 for a gram, I think was the standard price at that time. And then looked at all the poisonous mushrooms and the lookalikes and watched the presentations. Uh-oh, I'm not going to risk it and just tossed it out. And then so we scooped it up. And I sent it off to Ottawa to the National Fungus Collection, where they have a dried fungus collection in Ottawa called Department of Agriculture, Ottawa Mycology Herbarium. And so this is now ensconced in a cabinet somewhere in Ottawa uh, with a little story accompanying it. And now I mentioned that the taking these things very lightly, they're powerful psychological compounds. They can have a profound influence on a person's uh, 
mental well-being if a person is fragile or if somebody's not expecting it, if they're not prepared, if it's given to them by accident or with malicious intent. It can have very negative consequences. There were several incidents in Haida Gwaii involving people that just ate them at parties. People would be half drunk and somebody would pass around a bowl of dried mushrooms and they woof down a couple of handfuls without even thinking and then eventually end up hospitalized. And sometimes they were people that were recovering from serious trauma in their life and it would just be a nasty thing. Uh, I say people guardedly. Well, this became such an issue that now they are very careful up there. They're very aware of the possible downfalls of these. So I attended a Halloween party a few years ago there in 2008 and there, somebody had baked brownies with 150 semilanciata in them in the batch of brownies and he was passing them around and he had this paper plate that he decorated and he had the, the bowl of the brownies, and he'd walk up to each and every person, look them in the eye and say, I've got some brownies made from mushrooms here, and then make them read this. And then he'd say, that's a magic mushroom. Do you understand? And he'd have them say, yes, I understand, before he'd allow them to eat one. He'd ask them, do you want to eat it? Are you sure? And no problem. It was so much fun watching all these people party, and everybody was just having a great time. No problem. <laughs> Mind you, Everybody I talked to said they weren't really sure if they caught a buzz off it. So he may have, maybe the cooking broke it down. or it was, The party was so weird, wonderful costumes, that maybe it was just so strange that nobody could tell if they were high or not. But anyway, that's something that's very important, is that a person be informed that they, you know, have a full free choice. If you believe people should have the personal choice to take a drug, they should also have the choice to not take a drug. So inadvertent dosing is something that's very dangerous. Young children should never be exposed to psilocybin. The only deaths attributed to psilocybin are uh, an incident in Portland where a couple of young children, I think five, six years old, something like that, ate mushrooms off the lawn and they both developed extremely high fever, 104, 106, Fahrenheit and uh, both went into convulsions and seizures and one of them died and it's believed that and it's been noted with accidental exposures among children that a high temperature develops and then eventually there can go into seizures if the temperature is, is high enough or if that's yeah so um, accidental exposure and that's a real catch with making and a lot of people now make chocolates they call them Scooby Scooby treats or something and they mix a powdered mushroom with chocolates and make these little chocolates and that's a dangerous practice if you have children around or uh, straight people that are chocoholics and you leave them laying around you know it can be a very dangerous practice because uh, being accidentally dosed on mushrooms is very unpleasant indeed even for people used to you know taking them intentionally um, Psilocybe stuntsy is a real weed. I brought some of these in that I found on, on campus at UBC. That's their natural habitat is campuses. <laughs> and it was first discovered a U of W campus named after a professor there, Daniel Stuntz. And it showed up at campuses. And again, it's a weed mushroom, so it especially shows up institutional landscaping situation. So police stations, courthouses hospitals, you know, that sort of thing. Um, extremely variable, little ring on the stem, can vary widely in color and shape. And uh, another um, a very fairly uncommon mushroom is Psilocybe subfimitaria. And this one I'm kind of proud of because it was discovered a few blocks from here. And so the, the type location, as we call it, is in Vancouver just above 41st on somebody's front lawn. And uh, the world expert on psilocybe, Dr. Gaston Guzman, was visiting Vancouver and I took him all over the city and showed him all sorts of places where the mushrooms grew. And this was one collection that turned out to be an undescribed species. So it was named Subfimitaria, the type location just up there. And I heard him talking to uh, one of the people that was there from California who was serving as translator. And uh, I heard him 
asked the conversation going back and forth in Spanish. So I asked Dale, what did he say? And he said, well, he's just really puzzled. He is asking, do magic mushrooms grow everywhere in Vancouver? How do people get anything done? Uh, it says, hey, uh, everywhere, I was taking it from one little urban spot to another. In those days, they grew everywhere. It was phenomenal in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, how prevalent these things were in Vancouver. Uh, now, deadly lookalikes, gallerinas, several wood inhabiting gallerinas contain deadly amatoxins, which are complex molecules that attack the liver. First symptoms come on 12 to 36 hours after the mushroom's totally absorbed and has a long course of a couple of weeks that in about 60% of cases ends in death. The only way to prevent death with a heavy dose of these is liver transplant. And, um, and these uh, little brown mushrooms closely resemble the psilocybe, like psilocybe stuntsy, say, and they can grow in the same habitat in the same place. It's not unusual to find psilocybe stuntsy in the gallerinas growing in the very same landscaping intermixed. And again, I mentioned trying to sort out Pelliculosa and the gallerina heterocystis. Well, the same situation with psilocybe stuntsy, and these wood gallerinas can exist too. And um, uh, it's amazing how few serious poisonings there were given the popularity of the magic mushrooms at one point, the prevalence throughout urban areas, the number of people that were into picking and eating them. Truly remarkable. Now there's a totally unrelated mushroom to the psilocybe that's called Canosybe cyanopus. And it's a tiny, tiny little thing that's quite rare. Rarely see it. I've only seen it. Uh, we used to find it in a few years in the 1970s, and then I found it in 2000, I think it was, or 2001, and suddenly went, holy crap, I don't remember finding that for the last 20 years or so. So I looked up in my records and, and other records and found that it hadn't been found in BC for a long, long time. That was a very hot, wet summer. We had just day after day of muggy sort of you know, rain and it just day after day. It was almost like an Ontario summer here. So I think that was what it was like in the 70s during the peak of Vancouver's mushroom craziness. We had wet summers for several years in a row. So I think these things are often linked into weather patterns. They have a tiny bit of blue staining at the base and you can see how tiny they are. And uh, what's really scary is there's relatives, Canosybe filaris group, that contain the same deadly amatoxins that attack the liver as the gallerinas contain. And so there's two species of mushroom in the same genus that contain one is psychoactive and the other potentially deadly. Fortunately, these are very, very tiny. So it would take a hell of a lot of them to cause death. Uh, Paniola subaltiatus is something that naturally grows in um, horse manure, old, old horse manure. It can grow in rotting hay and straw. And this is um, just after they built the biodiversity, uh, BD Biodiversity Museum at UBC. Uh, they laid down very rich um, grass mix soil with lots of ammonia and, and compost and manure in it. And, and then planted grasses, and they had very lush grass growth, and then the grasses sort of died out for the winter, and the next year there was a deep layer of rotting grasses with the new grass pushing through, and all sorts of these Paniola subaltiatus grew. They characteristically have a dark ring around the edge. That's char characteristic of them. And they're mildly hallucinogenic, but they contain a lot of urea, too, and serotonin and other things. But most people that try eating these get a bit of a bellyache because they have all these urea and similar compounds. And uh, uh, gym Gymnopolis are big wood-inhabiting mushrooms, very colorful, bright orange, brown gills, and red shaggy cap. And spore print is bright reddy orange brown and these are this clump actually it was just put on a piece of paper overnight and that produced that spore print and the spore printing mushrooms can create beautiful art as well as help you identify the mushroom 
And so if you're doing this, if you have clumps of mushrooms, something you can do is put down a piece of white paper and put little leaves and feathers and fern fronds on the paper and then put the mushrooms over top. Overnight they drop spores and leave silhouettes of the feathers and leaves and ferns. And they can build up with a different color spore print on top of that and create pieces of art. Great hobby for kids and for adults too especially if you're eating mushrooms at the time. Um, Gymnopolis aeruginosus is very colorful and funny looking. So I was experimenting with trying to make lawn ornaments out of them. Uh, they sort of reminded me of pink flamingos because they're pinky and very stretched out when they're grown this way. So I was thinking of making lawn ornaments, molded sawdust pink flamingos inoculated with this and they'd sprout out little pink mushrooms with orange gills and that stain blue. And uh, what do you think? Living like chia pet type lawn ornaments? Wouldn't that be fun? I think it oyster mushrooms too. You can mold sheep bodies out of straw and put them in your front lawn and have oyster mushrooms growing out of them. Little flocks of oyster mushroom sheep. But anyway, and then they're quite colorful and quite... And this is a bag of sawdust inoculated with uh, gymnopolis. Uh, now, I mentioned the tourism, uh, psychedelic mushroom tourism in Mexico. Eventually, as these things got really popular, other areas of the world, especially tropical, subtropical areas, became popular because uh, the magic mushrooms grew there too. Psilocybe cubensis is one that's around the tropical world, wherever it's moist enough. And this is Thailand, uh, the island of Koh Samui, where there were little beach huts selling magic mushroom omelets. And for a while, it was a great destination for backpackers. It was part of the North American and Western European backpacking tour around Asia. And um, so there's big party scenes and these little omelet joints, huts, popped up on beaches all over Thailand. And then they uh, started, oddly enough, making these magic mushroom omelets available out of season. It turned out some of them were adulterating regular mushrooms with LSD or horse tranquilizer, methamphetamine, or all sorts of mixtures of crap. And there were some serious incidents, including people dying. And then the government began to crack down on the whole scene. And it was about the time that Thailand went really upscale anyway, and all the tourism became great big luxurious resorts. It cost a lot of money, so it was no longer a backpacking destination anyway. And that happened in several areas of the world where the Psilocybe cubensis grew naturally. And this is what the Psilocybe cubensis looks like, and they grow quite easily. They're one of the easiest mushrooms to grow, so lots of people grow them indoors in North America and other temperate areas and um, but you can grow them outdoors in the summer too in our hot summers and this is a bunch growing on composted straw in the backyard in Vancouver but most of them are like this they're grown indoors in little closets and cupboards and basement rooms and uh, they look really leggy little tiny caps on great big fat stems and now that's the uh, psilocybin mushroom presentation and I just want to mention that there is the other type of magic mushroom, the fly agaric Amanita muscaria. Uh, lots of folklore and mythology around it, so much so that it would be a whole presentation longer than this one to cover. Just begin to skim the surface of all the neat material about Amanitas and uh, which I'll someday put together a slideshow, hopefully not too flaky a slideshow. And um, a totally different chemistry, different effects. It's more of a delirient than a real true psychedelic, not a true hallucinogen. And um, there's the most common cause of poisoning in this part of the world is Amanita pantherina, close relative of muscaria, but with much, much more active ingredient in it, ibotenic acid and muscimol, and it's caused lots and lots of poisoning. It's the most common cause of poisoning in this part of the world, and uh, we've actually had a death um, from this in BC a few years ago from a young man who ate them to try to get high and ended up asphyxiating on his vomit when he was unconscious. 
and uh, but that's a whole different bunch. And the chemistry, um, so the Amanita muscaria is considered to be the classic toadstool. That's warty and lives in wet places and sort of has a war, uh, toad look about it, I guess. So it's always being associated with toads. Some toads are hallucinogenic. The Bufo marinus here is a giant marine toad and it produces toxin called bufotenine, which is actually an indole compound, a tryptamine, related to psilocybin. There's your indole ring with a little doodad sticking off bufotenine, classic toad toxin. Turned out when they were analyzing various mushrooms that they discovered that this mushroom, Amanita porphyria, contains bufotenine, the toad toxin. So I posit that this is the real toadstool, Amanita porphyria, and this one is not. I might just remember that the magic mushrooms are illegal, and if you should visit Australia, uh, be it known that it is illegal to suck, lick, or smoke this toad. So if you're in Australia and see a bunch of these toads, which you would because they're acting like weeds, they're all over the place, um, don't lick, suck, or smoke them in public because you'll be in trouble. And, but uh, ironically, it's also illegal to possess serotonin in Australia. And that's an uh, uh, active component of our brain. Everybody with a brain has lots of serotonin contained in their head. So evidently the Australians don't like people bringing brain into their country. <laughs> so if you are entering Australia and they ask you if you're carrying anything illegal, say, yes, my brain. <laughs> right. no, no. Anyway, and that's the absurdity of illegalizing things that grow naturally. Where do you stop? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. paradigm shift.